Namaste. Welcome to Dave's Hammer Show. This is weekly television shows of indigenous television in which sometimes I conduct face-to-face -face interviews, sometimes I conduct online video conferences. And I try to bring the voices of indigenous peoples from across the globe. And I try to share their not only voices but also lessons and try to connect with one another. Today, I have invited very special guests who is a General Secretary of uh, Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact. Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact is a regional umbrella organization of Indigenous Peoples organizations which is based in Asia and who is best advocates of Indigenous peoples' rights, uh, basically on the rights of uh, right, indigenous people's right to self-determination. His name is Gam Sim Ray. And first of all, I would like to welcome you to the show. Thank you. And uh, today uh, with Gam Sim Ray, a secretary, of, uh, secretary General of AIPP, I'm going to discuss about the uh, indigenous people's right to self-determination. When we talk about the right to self-determination, it is one of the fundamental rights of indigenous peoples and uh, which is guaranteed under a number of international human rights as well. Uh, but then it has been harshly debated. And uh, to this, with this background, basically, I would like to know from you mm -hmm. how we basically understand or, you know, how this right to self-determination is supposed to be understood, basically. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, when we talk about self-determination, Indigenous peoples have always asserted, yes, you are right, that it's an inherent right of every peoples and also of actually every individuals. Now it is at the collective level, it also is at the individual level. The relationship of this needs to be understood. And indigenous peoples have always taken this position that without the right to self-determination and self-government, we cannot begin to start to enjoy our actual real human rights. That's basically the position. Now, why this is so important, that's what I would like to share a little bit. And that is to say, I always take this position that the um, right to self-determination and self-government is a social necessity. Now, this is the aspect that people don't try to understand. People always try to see that Assertion for right to self-determination is a political threat to the other groups and it will also lead to territorial integration and so on by the states, no? which I think is a misconception. Rather, we have to see self-determination as a process where we can transform conflict and lead to transformation so that we begin to solve a lot of these bloodshed and violence that is going around the world. Actually, that is the very basis of how actually UN DRIP was conceived, drafted, and finally adopted. It's really basically in one line is to say, to begin to reduce violence and, and blood, you know, then you spill all over the world, that's the thing. Now, why I say that this is a no so, uh, social necessity? Um, I would like to explain this a little bit. And this would be contextual in the sense that government of India or even Nepal government, for that matter, every government will say that uh, and will affirm and uphold this uh, whole idea of cultural diversity. Without that social space, that's why I'm saying is a social necessity. How can this kind of language diversity, identity diversity or cultural diversity can thrive? It's basically a contradictory position. And that has to be overturned and understood in a proper way. So, for example, what I'm saying is why it is a social necessity is that all of us, including you or everyone, not just indigenous, we have the love for our homes and values that are very much part of ourselves, that is in our blood, in our bones. Now, when I say this, um, it means that there are many kinds of attachments that as human beings we have. And what are these attachments? These, these are a range of emotions and values to which we are attached. And that defines who we are and also defines our well-being and so on. So what this means is that, for example, I have my attachment to my brothers and sisters and to my parents and as also as family. So we have close attachments. But beyond the family, 
also comes our uh, clan, for example, in the case of indigenous peoples. And then from the clan, it goes to the community level. So we have this kind of strong attachment. And these attachments determines who we are and how we are also relating. And we have attachment to our land, territories, and resources, whether it's rivers, mountains, sacred sites, and all that we say. We have this kind of attachments. Now this attachment begins to determine how we relate with one another within the family, within the clan, within the, uh, with our land. And that leads to what? It's the kind of our art forms, our worldviews, our all kinds of things, songs, craft, and so on. These are the kinds of inspiration. And that inspiration cannot come without this kind of attachments. So if there is no social space to protect and promote these things, then ultimately you are saying uh, cultural diversity and all this kind of things. But it, ultimately you are saying, okay, rhetorically we are firm, but uh, you, you know you are wiped out. You don't exist anymore. Uh, gradually, you know this is the thing. So that is why self determination is really for our survival. It affects every day's life, our sentiments, the way we look at issues, and the way we look at the world. It everything. Uh, art form everything. So it's a range of things. It's not just about human rights just because we have human rights, but the basis of the human right is coming from this. Why should we have right over this? Is because we cannot exist without these things as, as human beings. No? That is uh, how, in very brief sense, I understand as uh, self-determination, and that's what we're struggling for. And in, in the background, in our uh, separate conversations, you have just simply told me that right to self-determination is basically in basic form or simple term, this basically means right or freedom to decide or determine for indigenous peoples on any issues that is affecting for indigenous peoples or even your brief I mean, uh, description, just you said that this is all about the freedom. Mm. Uh, uh, for indigenous peoples to determine, uh, to live in their own social life side, right? Yes. yes. In, if that is then, mm -hmm. why the governments are opposing to uphold this right mm. of indigenous peoples, basically? Yes, I think, which I partially responded already, but let me try to elaborate. I think this is the misconception that the government has, as I said, that this kind of right will lead to integration of states, it will lead to more conflict and bloodshed and so on. No? That is a misunderstanding. As I said, and second thing is their whole idea of cultural diversity. I don't know where, it, where does it come from. So this kind of perception is the uh, obstacle. And now uh, one of the, the also barrier is the whole mainstream discourse have not tried to understand this conception of self-determination and self-government of indigenous peoples and where does it come from you know this this is what they have not understood and therefore always what they will look at is whether it's government or mainstream societies have essentially looked at that these are tribal issues yeah uh, and it has nothing to do with them but the basic point is that what the mainstream society and government must begin to see is that indigenous self-determination is a democratic movement. Therefore, it relates to the larger level. That means indigenous peoples are looking for what? Political understanding establishing with the governments and also transforming this political relationship with the state and also with other people. You see, that is the transformative approach that indigenous peoples are actually saying. So it is a progressive democratic approach where there is a social and political transformation. This aspect of transformation is the one that states are not understanding and they are not giving enough effort to really actually understand uh, this perspective of indigenous peoples and why this is necessary. They are looking at it only from political threat. You see, it's a very risk and threat perception that they're having. But look at it this way that this is a social necessity. No social necessity for my survival as indigenous one, 
social necessity as transforming the relationship between indigenous and mainstream society and also with the government. So that's a political transformation and social transformation. That is the aspect of discourse that the states and mainstream intellectuals and all other citizens are not understanding. I see that as to be one of the major obstacles. As you clearly mentioned that the right to self-determination is a social necessity. Perhaps this is because why even the UN, when it drafted or adopted the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights mm -hmm. and ICC ASEA, mm -hmm. International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, right? The conventions mm -hmm. and other mm -hmm. the convention in nineteen sixties. In this international covenant as well, uh, very clearly in their articles basically mention that each individual have right to self determination mm. in that sense, right? Yes. So uh, if and as you are the Secretary General acting in AIPP as you have been working across Asia, mm. I want to just uh, know how the indigenous peoples across this Asia basically struggling to exercise this right as set forth in such a number of international human rights treaties as I said. Yes, we have been trying to have dialogues with uh, various governments including the Asian governments and one of the platforms and avenues that we have used is definitely these international forums, particularly the uh, UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and other kinds of mechanisms, human rights mechanisms that is uh, there. Now we have actively engaged there and our engagement actually uh, really was strengthened and increased uh, um, after the adoption of the UN Declaration uh, on, on the rights of Indigenous peoples in 2007. No? You see the problem is that even um, the governments have sort of adopted it and have not opposed it but this is also not in the spirit of actual adoption and recognizing indigenous peoples on the ground yes so they say they have adopted but they also say that there are no indigenous peoples and that is the reason behind that they are adopting so it's not with a recognition that they're really going to implement so therefore the space and the ground is very minimal and often also confrontational. It leads to protest and argument and so on. That is also the reason why we are increasingly going and trying to use those avenues where perhaps sometimes it provides better environment to you know, come and discuss and talk. So there are many such um, global processes in different forms. So let's say in the form of workshop, let's say sometime the UN organizes for us a regional dialogue with governments and indigenous peoples on specific issues. And we try to overcome some of these obstacles um, that exist. No? So in various forms. Um, so it's not just the mechanisms in the legal sense that we're using. We're very clear that there has to be political processes. And that is why we go beyond those legal mechanisms that exist at the international forum. So in those avenues also is where we are talking with uh, between various indigenous groups who are also struggling for the right to self-determination and government and with the various uh, friendly governments. You know? And that has been very, very instrumental because our support have come more from them rather than our governments because we have are yet to transcend this very confrontational uh, position. So we use <coughs> many methods uh, actually, so it's not just a mechanism there. But just one important point, this confrontational relation that reminds me when you ask me uh, <coughs> the challenges uh, we face when we're trying to discuss uh, with the governments and the intellectuals and civil society organizations. You see, look at it also this way. The concept of neighbors and neighborliness. <laughs> uh, I'm saying this transformation, if, if, if I may elaborate a little bit more. In most cases today, after this post-colonialism as they call it, in most cases now indigenous peoples find ourselves encapsulated within state systems <clears throat> and within state 
boundaries and territory. So now what? Who are our neighbors? <clears throat> Different kinds of communities and governments, you see. That's why I'm saying about more so important about this <clears throat> transforming this social political relationship. That has to be the approach and engagement and government must have that uh, vision and other communities must have that similar vision, you see. So you look at it this way that neighbor means what? I have my house here and another person come and builds his or her house. Yeah, so just nearby and that's my neighbor. Now who is this neighbor? He can be a very violent, dangerous guy. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm going to have a hard time <clears throat> if my neighbor is not friendly, you see. So we are situated like that now as neighborhood. But what kind of neighborhood do we want to build? You see, that's why neighborliness, I would definitely have be, be much more peaceful if I have a friendly neighbor. So the concept of neighborliness, you see, I'm just using some other term because often people think that you start using human rights word and political words is dangerous, you know, you find it very repulsive. <laughs> so you understand it this way, right? So who is a neighborly person. A neighborly person is having some kind of relationship and as we live on together our relationship grows. It's a person in which we can look eye to eye, talk to each other, right? And make sense of what we discuss. Not in terms of even if we have differences or different understanding, not starting to fight immediately because we have our own positions. But we have that relationship where we can transcend our uh, disagreements or and that's how we grow right so neighborliness is about having understanding the common yardstick of how we relate with one another yeah and therefore we are able to make sense of each other so we make meanings of the word that we speak we discuss we dialogue and whatever agreement we make we implement we follow after all agreement is what every agreement there is a principle that follows behind it, and that is implementation, honoring, respecting, having the commitment that you have made an agreement. Otherwise, what is the meaning of agreement? And that is the problem of this understanding of grounding of what agreement is. Government makes agreement here. I say, okay, I make agreement later on. I will not implement. I am in the authority. I am in the power. It doesn't matter. This kind of, uh, you see, uh, attitude. So, in the concept of neighborliness, this is what we are talking about. So we build relation. That's what I mean to say it is a range of uh, this attachment I'm talking. So we begin to have attachment between us as people, as communities, with the land, with the forest. You know, human life is all about this attachment. And it is this attachment that gives us this common yardstick to be able to communicate with one another. So if my neighbor don't have this conception, if I don't have this conception, we will keep on fighting. We have to look at it this way. It is sociological, it is also cultural. So, you see, we are ultimately looking for this kind of transformation and peace and therefore less violence and so on. This is uh, the indigenous uh, position. But even in the UN, when we meet, you come with your position, <laughs> with your mindset. So where will the dialogue go? This is the, uh, sometimes some of the limitations that we, uh, we face even though we still engage in the UN also. But yes, this is really the aspect that we need to discuss more. Clearly elaborated or, in, let me ask you in another way, mm. to uh, let you elaborate more in different way. When we talk about rights, mm. the well, it is well said that right is not something that you are given, but this is uh, the right you take, right? right? The right which is not given, but this is basically taken, right? As international mm -hmm. uh, instrument has already guaranteed, given you the rights. Mm -hmm. So perhaps we indigenous peoples ourselves are not in a position to claim or exercise. So in these situations, what is your view? What are the challenges basically indigenous peoples are facing basically or for realizing this right to self-determination? You see, when you are 
telling me about these rights are taken. No? <laughs> in some sense, I agree with you. So I would like to just put this in two contexts. We are facing a very confrontational situation. Politics is regressing all over Asia. States are becoming more repressive. Um, they don't want to listen and all this kind of thing. So we have to protest, we have to pressurize, and we have to create such an environment that the state has to concede in giving you the right. You see, that is our situation. And so in that sense, that is how we go and take our right. That is the logic, right? But this is happening in a situation where that political relationship and social cultural relationship we are talking about is not transformed. Okay, it is because of the political environment. Look at it this way now, in actual sense of human rights. Human right is really about responsibilities, obligations, duties. So without, in my understanding, without the sense of duties, you cannot have rights. So what the government is saying, they are not performing their duties. They are not performing their obligations. That's why we have to force them. In fact, then they have no moral authority to talk about rights. You see, in simple language, let me put it this way. For example, I say, okay, you know, I invite you, uh, today is my, um, uh, there is a good occasion, you know, uh, some kind of occasion. So I invite you, please come to my house. We'll have a dinner party and we'll have a good time. And you say, okay, Gam, I will come. And yes, this is very important. I will definitely come. And I will bring some juice or some wine or whatever to celebrate. All right. So what happens? Then you are giving me the right to expect <laughs> that you will come. And then you will bring X, Y, Z. Now, what you are, when you say that, then what happens is that I, you are giving me the right to expect that. So I'm expecting you and I have the right to expect that you will come and you will bring these things. Yeah, That means what you are doing is you are also creating an obligation for yourself <laughs> that you will do this. Right? So if we don't follow this logic and we fail to understand this, then the whole concept of rights break down. It doesn't work. So what I'm trying to say is that, for example, if between us, that uh, if I say that this is my right, okay, it means that I'm recognizing this same right to you. So my first moral and also obligation and duty comes that I first apply this same to you. Then only this right applies to me. You see the relationship between duty and rights. If you don't see this, it breaks down. So what happens if you come to a government authority? You are not uh, respecting and upholding these uh, principles and values that we are talking about rights. And that is why rights are not working. It is breaking down. It is in conflict. It is in a mess and people are not also understanding. You see, so this issue of grabbing rights is because of the political context and is because of our inappropriate appropriate understanding as well from governments and so on. No? So this, you see, this is the thing. So we have two situations, ideally speaking, and ground reality of, of how we are taking our uh, rights. You know? I have a lot of things to discuss, but uh, because of this time limitation, at last I would like to ask you mm. that uh, in your conversation as well, you well elaborated that one side governments are opposing Mm -hmm. uh, for indigenous peoples to realize these rights. On the other hand, indigenous peoples are struggling yes. to exercise these rights. Yes. So what uh, do you see the middle way? <laughs> How indigenous peoples also can best realize these rights and the government also can give a kind of authority or you know, way out to mm. exercise this <clears throat> right? Or what do you see the solution that kind of? Mm. So that what? everyone is happy, mm. right? Yes, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> when you say middle way, I would like to put it in another way that maybe to say a win-win situation. Um, you see, the whole thing is that <clears throat> we 
have to also indigenous peoples will have to move beyond its own comfort zone that's one um, and engage more with other civil societies and intellectuals because we have always said that intellectuals are the conscience keepers of those uh, country you know, in a democratic country <laughs> if it is democratic country otherwise intellectuals themselves are under always threat and they're targeted i know <laughs> of uh, uh, those things as well so indigenous peoples now is also time that we think this deeper, reassess our strategy, and see how we can engage with other peoples and communities and intellectuals to start with, you know, if we don't have much political space to talk with uh, governments. You know. Because when I'm saying win-win situation, uh, some people will say that if it is middle ground, it means you conceding something and decide conceding something and compromise approach kind of uh, thing. Sometimes negotiation, that is how it also works. But if you are really looking at issue of transformation, both sides understand this, how kind of, what kind of relationship you are going to build, right? And therefore, this is the best relationship that can work for both of us, right? That is sort of the win-win situation I'm talking about. And again, I'm saying this in a transformative sense that I just uh, described. So indigenous peoples have to step out of its limitations that you are facing um, and indigenous peoples also must realize that now there is a whole democratic challenge in Asian governments in some sense this is also an opportunity so there are many people beginning the question what is wrong with Asian democracy what is wrong with a lot of democratic countries in other parts of the world these questions being raised is also an opportunity for indigenous peoples to go forward and exploit that space. You know? and that is to say, like in some of the things that I just elaborated a little bit as, as an idea of a social necessity, as an idea of the neighborliness as a transformation, you know? looking at it that way. So what is this indigenous conception of self-government, of democracy, of autonomy, you see? That is an idea that it may flourish with, uh, with others as well, because that question is everywhere and people are uh, struggling as to where to look for some kind of answers. And as long as indigenous people are transformative in their approach and democratic and inclusive, I think uh, other sectors are bound to open up. And if they begin to see, the, oh yes, what indigenous peoples are saying is transformative, then we might find more support. You see, this is uh, one of the approach that indigenous peoples must adopt. And we have to find a way also to engage with government in another form. So maybe we need to discuss about democracy and governance more in that sense of what are the institutional weaknesses of the state to be able to respond to these human rights issues or to the issues of uh, self-government and so on. You know? in a more proactive way, uh, uh, in a, uh, so not in too much in a confrontational way sometimes. No? So you need to find different ways to do this. Uh, I think because governments are also stressed and they know they cannot respond to a lot of issues that we have. Institutionally, they have no capacity. And there are institutional design problems as well. No? So, so many issues are there. So maybe we need to find an entry to discuss with government in a proactive sense so that they also open up the door. But most importantly, yes, indigenous peoples must now prioritize reaching out to other sectors of the society. And now, because if you talk about democratic transformation, indigenous peoples are the only ones struggling as peoples. There is no other group now struggling as peoples. So indigenous peoples is a force. And then how can we make other communities and society realize that indigenous peoples is a transformative force. That would be the kind of strategy that we need to think, review, and come up with some kind of a strategy and approach that, uh, yeah, in a more uh, strategic way that we try to engage. Thank you so much, Gam Simmer, for your time and the strength talk that you shared with me. Thank you, thank you very much. So today, uh, in my show, I had a Gam Simmer as Secretary General of AIPP, basically we discussed about the indigenous people's right to self-determination, 
and our discussions basically revolved around the debate uh, surrounding right to self-determination. And today I have come to the end of the show. Next week I will come with a new guest uh, to discuss on new topics. And if you have any queries or feedbacks uh, regarding a program, you can reach me at indigenoustelevision at gmail.com. Uh, till then, have a good weekend. Bye-bye.